Hi, thanks for joining us on the Life of the Land is in its Real Estate. I am Keena Nisley, and I am a real estate agent at Keller Williams Honolulu. Today's guest is Josie Hines with 101 Financial and Aloha Lending Services. Hi, Josie. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Keena. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. Go ahead. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, okay. That's a super loaded question. Um, <laughs> uh, born and raised in Hawaii. I am first generation here. Um, one of six girls and a military family. So of the six of us, uh, four of us joined the military. I'm in the Coast Guard Reserves. I've been in the Coast Guard since 2005. And um, so on top of that, um, uh, you know, a lot of things. But um, most recently, I guess, back to stay at home mommy again <laughs> with three, Kiki. And then um, over the last five years, I was a, or I still am a 101 financial instructor. And um, last year I decided to don on a different hat. I became a mortgage loan officer. Um, and hence why we're here today. Yes. All right. So let's talk about why we are here today. So with COVID-19 and everything that's been going on, um, can people still buy a house? Can people still afford to buy a home in on Oahu during this pandemic? So yes, absolutely. People can definitely buy. And um, I think it, one good thing to note though, is there is a difference between qualifying and affording. Um, those are two totally different uh beasts, if you will. <laughs> you know, on the one side, a lot of people are, are really uh, focused on what they can qualify for. And but at the same time, it's always good to kind of have a guideline on how to figure out what you can afford, because there is a gap. Um, for example, when somebody comes to me wanting to wanting to purchase, um, I don't just look at their numbers. I also want to take a look at what they want to do after they buy this house. You know, if they're buying this house as an initial starter and then plan on upgrading later and whatnot, those are all, or if they want to have multiple properties, those are all kind of good things to know um, when we're going through the pre-qualification process. And of course, it's, it's good to know, um, you know, their income and their debt to income ratio. Um, so when they qualify you though, the biggest difference from being able to know what you can afford is that they qualify you on 100% of your gross income versus your net. And our net is what we actually take home. Um, and so if you think about your gross income and you actually take out the taxes, then it really kind of limits how much you actually have after you take into account you know, how much of their income is going to go to now this new home that they want to purchase versus how much they have to live on. Um, that kind of answered the question. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so what are um, some ways that, that can, people can prepare to, so they can afford to, to buy the house they qualify for? Right. So that is a great question. Um, so in terms of qualifying, um, you know, there's so many different types of loans out available for, for first time home buyers and, um, you know, like you, USDA loans, FHA loans are great when you don't have a down payment. And a lot of times they go, um, they go around the lower 600s and able to qualify. Um, the number they look at for uh, qualifying too is your, your, how much your, they call it DTI. So DTI is your debt to income ratio. So it's how much debt you have, how much your monthly debt payments is divided by your gross monthly income. And a lot of times they want you to um, be at most 50% or less. If you're doing an FHA or a first time home buyer, some um, first time home buyer, oh, sorry, FHA or USDA loan, they actually want it to be even lower, like 40, about 40%. So that means that 40% of your gross income um, can go to debt in order to qualify. So for example, say they made um, $10,000 a month, 
um, and I'm just using that because it's a nice round number, um, 4,000 of their, um, they cannot be paying more than $4,000 in debt in order to be at 40% debt to income ratio. And that's based on their gross income. Um, but a lot of times what I find is, um, so if this is your money pie, right? <laughs> and it's on 100% gross of your income, 50% or less can go to your debt. And so for me, um, before becoming more financially um, savvy, I would think that would lead me to think, okay, so that means I got 50% of my income to live on, right? Right. If you're doing 100 percent gross, 50 percent goes to, you know, your debt and I can qualify for a house that should leave me 50 percent, half of my pie to live on. Right. But if you take out your taxes and the average Americans in the 15 percent tax bracket, then 50 percent minus 15, 50 percent minus 15, that's like 35 percent of your income to actually live on, you know, and that's where um understanding what you can afford becomes really important when you're buying. Yeah. All right, so let's back up a little bit. Let's talk more about the USDA and the FHA options just so our, our viewers can kind of understand those more. So let's talk about USDA. So is, are there any limits on that or, or different parameters um, in order to do a USDA loan? Um, yes, so there is an income cap per the number of um, members in the household. So not necessarily how many people are going to be on the loan. So say you have three individuals in the house, right? But only two of them are going to be on the loan. They're actually going to take into account that third person's income in order to see if you um, are below the income cap. And so that's one of the things that um, that's good to be um, familiar with um, on whether or not you can do a USDA loan. And those um, those come with, uh, you could do it with 0% down. Um, so those are great options. The And then the FHA loan is somewhat similar. Uh, there is an income cap and um, also dependent on the number of people in the household and um, FHA, uh, FHA loan requires a 3.75% down. Okay. So, yeah, but so, both of them also have an upfront private mortgage insurance. And so that is, um, that's basically to, um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to describe a <laughs> PMI. <laughs> but it's basically ensuring that if the borrower was to default on the loan, that the bank would basically be paid for, um, you know, it would, it would, it, it insures the bank, not the borrower, basically. Okay. Yeah. The, okay. And so what kind of rates are they looking at with private mortgage insurance? What, what does that do to their payment, say on a, a $700,000 home? Oh gosh, I feel like I should have my um, encompass oh. moment right now. <laughs> but um, so those, um, it's a 1% upfront mortgage insurance. So that's part of your closing costs. And then I believe it's, and oh gosh, um, <laughs> I don't actually do too much FHA and USDA loans. I actually like a little bit more creative types of loans to avoid having a PMI. <laughs> but I believe it's like 0.75% of the loan amount divided by 12. It's something like it's something like 0.75 or 0.85%. So if you're buying and I'm um you know if you're yeah if it's a whatever if it's a $500,000 house you times that by 0.75 and then divide it by 12 and then that's what you pay additional to your mortgage payment um, monthly. And you can also, you know, get rid of the PMI. Um, you can uh, refinance it at a later time, but you need to be at 78% for a FHA loan. So 78% loan to value ratio. So if uh, you bought a house that was a um, hundred thousand, let's just say, and you put 3.5% down, that would put you at 96.7% um, of the loan amount 
remaining. You would need to pay it down to 78% in order to get rid of the PMI. So um, are there strategies that you can give people that, that they can pay that down faster? Um, <laughs> so yes, actually. Um, um, so before becoming a mortgage loan officer, um, like I said, I'm a one-on-one financial instructor as well. And I love 101 Financial. Uh, what we do, it's financial education, and we teach you how to um, be more akamai about money, how the banking institutions work. You know, we teach you about interest and, um, of course, budgeting and how to get organized with your finances so that you can pay down your debt quicker. So perfect example would be my own. Um, Let's see, we, in 2015, um, we had a flood and then a broken tub and we just had baby number three. I was a stay-at-home mom and my husband worked for Spectrum and um, we we're kind of like, okay, what are we gonna do? Because our really good situation where I could stay home and you know we, we were able to afford it uh, went really bad really quick. And so we heard about 101 Financial and we were like, okay, how are our friends paying off cars, buying houses after going on bankruptcy like two years prior? Like, how are they doing this? So we got on 101 Financial and the education that we teach um, is actually really simple. We just teach you how you can turn your normal money that would normally be going to interest now to the principal to help you pay it off faster. Um, so it's interest savings to now go towards your principal to help you pay things off a lot faster. And so in our first six months, we were able to pay off our $26,000 car loan. Um, so we started September of um, September of 20, uh, 2015. March 2019, we paid off our car. And then April, we went to Florida for my sister's wedding and then had my daughter's first birthday party the month after. So like my first year, it was about 45,000 in debt and expenses that we were able to take care of in our first year. And then we moved forward to um, buying a second property after we were on the program for a year and a half. So that's another thing I love about 101. Uh, we basically breed home homeowners <laughs> um, because we can help you pay down your debt really quickly as well as increase your um, credit score decrease your DTI all of the factors that come into play with wanting to qualify to purchase a house and then on top of that we also you when you run your system you'll know what you can afford because we help you create this 90 day roadmap that essentially details all the ins, all the outs, um, and how much money you should basically have, how much you can put into savings. So you could just plug in, okay, I wanna, I wanna adjust my rent, which is 1500 to a mortgage at now 2000. And when you put that into your roadmap, you'll be able to see if your numbers are positive or negative or zero and then be proactive to make changes to it, you know, to create the end result that you want um, that fits within your, um, your finances. So I don't want you to give away, you know, the, the secrets that, that <laughs> are coming into the program for, um, but, but is it, is it a matter of like, you know, go out to E or, you know, how, how are people saving the money to be able to do this? How did, what did you cut back on? Did you have um, a lot? Actually, in the beginning, when we first did the program, we we just had to know where everything was going, right? Because if you don't tell your money where to go, you're going to be left wondering where the hell it went. You know, it's like, uh, okay, so right, if you don't have a plan for it, it's just going to go all over the place. We're not going to know um, where where it is, basically. And so, um, so when we first started our program and we were able to pay off that 26000 on our car loan, we we actually just had to know what was coming in, what was going out. Um, and then when we saw that it was going fast, like how quickly we were able to pay it off, then that was where we were like, okay, um, where can we trim the fat, right? That's when we really looked at our budget because we wanted to do it faster. 
you know, we were already able to do it fast enough. I mean, for us, 26,000 in six months is pretty fast. So uh, we wanted to do it faster. So that's where we really got into uh, the details of our finances. Like how much are we spending on gro um, groceries a week? How much on gas? How much on entertainment? How much on eating out? And when you look at it, when you break it down into those little buckets, then that's where you can kind of trim it down um, and reverse engineer it basically to see where maybe you can um, uh, trim it down. So then now your system will run faster because it's all about your cash flow. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. My computer is making noises. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's all about your cash flow and cash flow is you know, after what comes in, all our bills that are paid and our living expenses, what do we have left? Um, so that's your cash flow. And once you get a handle on that, that's what's going to really enable you to know what you can and can't do. Um, and it's also the driver of the one one program. It's going to help you be able to pay it down faster, pay your debt down faster. Yeah. Okay, so they've gone through that and now they're ready to buy. So let's go back over to your other hat, um, <laughs> officer. Um, you mentioned some, you know, USDA, yes. There, um, I do need to mention there are only certain parts of the island that you can use a USDA loan. Um, and and we, we can help you with that if that's something you're interested in. Um, and, and we talked about FHA, but you mentioned some other creative ways um, to buy a home, other mortgage, other creative mortgage ways. So if you could share some of those, um, I'm sure we have a lot of people that'd be interested. Right, yeah. So um, so ideally, traditionally, right, when you're buying a home, they always say, if you can come up with 20% down, then that would be the best option because now you don't have that private mortgage insurance that you'd have to pay monthly. Um, but, uh, you know, 20% down on the single what is the what is the um median house oh, going I, for now i have not even, even looked for this month it was 860 then 790 you're looking at yeah you're looking around 800,000 for your your average single family home on oahu right now right exactly and so you know if the if the homes are going at 800 20% you know, that's $160,000. Not to mention you still have closing costs on top of that. That's just your down payment. So you probably need more like 170 if you're buying an $800,000 house. Um, so that's why FHA loans, USDA loans are a bit more uh, appealing, right? Even though you have the private mortgage insurance. Um, another option where you have a little bit more flexibility on the mortgage insurance is a 95% conventional loan. So that means a 5% down and then 95% um, conventional. So it comes with private mortgage insurance, but the private mortgage insurance is based on your, your credit score. So instead of just the flat 0.7 or 0.8% for the FHA and USDA loans, it's, var it's variable depending on your credit. So if you have, if you have a higher credit score, you would have a lower private mortgage insurance. So that's one other option that I like to look at. And then another option that I like to look at is a, is a 80, 15, five. So 85, per, oh, excuse me, 80% 80 conventional loan, a second, um, sorry, 80, 80% 80 conventional, 15% piggyback HELOC, and then a 5% down. So how does that work? Can you so your simul- so, um, so you would be closing on basically on two mortgages simultaneously. So the first one would be the 80% conventional loan and then the 15% HELOC, you would close them simultaneously. And then your 5% down, the 5% down plus the 15% HELOC, that would be your 20% down. So you could avoid mortgage insurance. So now can you explain to everyone where, where are you getting the 15% HELOC? Just in case some people don't know what a HELOC is. Okay, gotcha. So a HELOC is a home equity line of credit. Um, so how I'm, I have a couple going through right now, um, there's a, so I usually try to find the lender that has the best rates, right? For the 80% loan to value based on their credit and all that. And then um, the, the probably right now, um, 
and I hope I don't get into any trouble, but the bank that I'm using right now for the 15% HELOC, I'm not gonna get in trouble, um, is HSFCU, Hawaii State Federal Credit Union. Yeah, because they will go up to 95% combined loan to value. Combined meaning your first and your second combined is not more than 95% of the value. So they're basically pulling out equity of the home that they're, they're buying. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So totally. They don't own the home yet, but they can still go in and pull the equity out to mm -hmm. help as the down payment to yeah. avoid the mine. So that, yeah, that is a great strategy. So people can afford to buy a home that, yeah. So, um, so now let's talk, we, we have a few minutes left. What if people do want to refinance out of a loan, um, how is that working? Can, can they refinance? We meant you touched on it a little bit. Can you refinance out of a loan that you are playing, you know, a high PMI on? Right. Or even a high interest rate. Yes, you definitely can. And with refinances, usually the, at least the closing cost is rolled into the loan. So you don't have to worry about having, you know, closing costs. Um, and I think the biggest thing right now with COVID is that they are requiring they are requiring additional documentation just to show that your income has not been affected by COVID. So they will ask for um, income verification in the beginning, as well as right before closing, like two days before closing, they're going to go and get an income verification to make sure that the income hasn't changed as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. So we're having them where they're calling em employers. Mm -hmm. And someone yeah. better pick up the phone because <laughs> if they don't, they know they're not business anymore. Right. Um, so with the refinance, mm -hmm. um, is there a, a PMI if you're refinancing something or can you, can you totally get rid of the PMI? Um, the that's a great question. It really depends on your loan to value ratio. So I want to just explain loan to value ratio. Um, so when the house gets appraised, it gets a value, right? And so the loan to value is just how much of the loan um, is outstanding in, in regards to what the value is. So you just divide those two numbers up and that's where you get the percentage of the loan to value ratio. And um, if you do have a PMI and you wanna get rid of it, you need to be at 80% or less loan to value ratio to refinance it without it. All right. But so you can still refinance uh, like a FHA loan or a USDA loan to get a lower interest rate. Um, but if you're still above the 78%, 80% loan to value ratio, 78% per, 78 for FHA, 80% for USDA. Um, if you're still above it, then you'll refinance it with the PMI still attached. All right. Yeah. So are there any other tips and tricks that you um, can share with our viewers if, if they yes. are willing to buy a home? Um, well, actually, it was actually in regards to uh, refinancing because you said tip. Um, so on your closing docs, there is a number called tip. It's your total interest paid. And so if you're looking to refinance, I would highly suggest looking at what your tip is, um, your total interest paid over the life of the loan. Because even though your APR or your um, might be like 4% or 3.5%, your tip is upwards of 50, sometimes 60% of the interest you're gonna pay over the life of the loan. Um, so whenever I'm looking at refinances, I always try to make sure we're beating the tip and that the refinance makes sense. And then just in regards, of, in regards to purchasing, um, just really taking a look at your, um, not just your bills, but your living expenses. Cause your living expenses is gonna help you know what you can afford, um, you know, how much is groceries, eating out, gas, electricity, all of that, it, it comes into play to help you understand what you can afford when you're buying a house. So, and really quick, what if someone wants to pay off their house mm -hmm. sooner than later? Is that possible? Uh, you don't want yeah. to take the 30 years. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, if you do the bi-weekly payments, that can cut off about, I think, four or five years on your on your um, mortgage term. Um, with 101 Financial, we utilize different strategies, um, kind of like 
chunking or snowballing towards your debt, but very, very strategic so that when you're making these extra principal payments, you, you every time you do that, you're shaving off interest as well as time. I'll give you a quick example because I know we're get, getting close, but um, um, I had a student who she was able to, we were able to calculate she could do a 16,000 um, accelerated payment to her, her mortgage. Um, by September. And when she does that, she's, she's saving 22 months. So she's shaving off 22 months on her term, her 30 year term. And we added up all the interest she would have paid and it equal to about $50,000. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if people um, would like to talk to you about budgeting and then, and then buying a house, um, they can reach out to you directly. Um, yep, you can reach out to me. I can connect you with Josie. I do believe we have our contact information. Um, should have been flashed somewhere. If not, you can reach out. You can comment on the video. I can connect you. Thank you so much. It was great information, and hopefully, um, we can help people who who didn't realize that they they could afford to buy a home. Um, yeah. We can help them into their home. It is something we both love love to do. So thank you so much for joining us on the life of the land is in its real estate. Um, and thank you Think Tech Hawaii for having us. I will see you all in two weeks where we will talk about 1031 exchanges. Um, for those people with investment properties that would like to maybe buy up, change in, do something a little different, um, I will have Tiffany here and to go over some of the pitfalls of a 1031 exchange and then some of the benefits. So I will see you all in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Josie. Thank and I will see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Aloha.